to Stonecrest. Whether you're online or in person with us, we're so excited to have you. Um, my name is Sarah Hollander, and if we haven't met yet, I'm looking forward to it. I'm a part of the worship team here, as well as the young adult group, and thanks to my wonderful co-host, I just got the opportunity to be a part of the senior high team. She is killing it in student ministry. She is in the young adults group and, and really press it in there as well as on the worship team. It's been so cool to see the ways you've been able to do that. If that's something, uh, if, if you would love to get plugged in in some way, maybe God's moving in your heart now and going like, oh, I'd love to get involved with this or that. Uh, we would love to help you step into that as well. The, the growth track is the way that we do that. So if you wanna do that, uh, more information about that is on our website, and, and you can jump in with us, and we'd love to help you get started with that. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Nick Galuccio, and I'm the Youth and Young Adults Pastor here at, at Stonecrest. Uh, and before we do anything else, we would love to give you an update on the pastoral search for, for here at Stonecrest. Uh, Justin Pennington and Catherine Oftedal will be sharing that with us, so let's watch that all together now. Welcome Stonecrest family. This is Justin Pennington. I'm an elder and vice chair of the governing board. And uh, I'm here today to reintroduce you to Catherine Oftedal. Many of you know her as our uh, assistant treasurer of the governing board. She's also playing a very important role for us during the time of pastoral search. She's the chair of our pastor search committee and she has some important information to share with you this morning. Thank you, Justin. So today I would like to announce with you that we have uh, confirmed who is on this pastor search committee. We have three elders, Russ Nelson, Andy Ma, and Walter Slade, two governing board members, myself and Danny Aller, and then four members of the congregation. Adelise alvarez Craft, Joella Diaz, Emily Salamini, and Evan Omanase. So nine members in total, and we would really appreciate your prayers for us during this important time. We have just begun meeting together, and um, so we'll have more to come in a couple weeks time. And I would actually like to just take some time this morning to pray for Catherine and the team and just uh, start out with a blessing for the process. Father God, I just pray right now for the team, Catherine and all the other members that you'll just put wisdom upon their shoulders and discernment and that um, as they begin the process that you would just help them identify candidates that live up to what our what we do here at Stonecrest and what we believe. And I just pray for whoever might apply for the positions that you would start in their hearts now um, and have them uh, consider uh, whether or not Stonecrest might be a place that they'd want to come. And I just pray that you would give overall the church just a, a sense of unity uh, and a sense of um, excitement over what's to come here at Stonecrest. We ask this in your name, amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much for that message. Um, it's really encouraging just to stay connected in this time of social distance um, and kind of uncertainty. Um, so I really appreciate the update and looking forward to more to come. Um, speaking of things happening now, um, we have our Operation Christmas Child um, going on, which is my personal favorite um, piece of the holiday, if you will. My family every year would put together boxes together um, as a family and we would send them off. And now that I'm moved away from them, I've kept up the tradition. Um, so we have shoe boxes here, as well as you can use your own shoe box um, to put those together. Um, hope, you, hope you press into that because it's definitely something that I look forward to every year. Yeah, so maybe that's something you could do with your family or with a life group, or maybe it's just something that you feel like God is calling you to do individually. Like, there's so many ways that you could do that. Uh, there's more information about how to get plugged in with it on our website, but most importantly, we need those back from you on November 22nd, so make sure you get that uh, to us by then so we can get them sent out. Uh, we would love to do that together. Same day, November 22nd, we will having, we'll be having our uh, Thanksgiving online service at 9 and 11 a.m. It's going to be great. Uh, we are super excited for it. Um, would you tell us a little more about it? So um, I'm really looking forward to it because we have testimonies um, from a couple of different people. Um, and it's just kind of what God's been doing and how God's hand is being shown in this time of social distancing and COVID um, and definitely uncertainty. So please join us for that. 
And to see the ways that God really has been moving, it, it has been so cool, whether that's the ministries that we get to do here at Stonecrest or whether that's giving to the communities around us or, or maybe people who have need within our church. There's, there's so many ways that, uh, that your giving has gone uh, outward and, and gone to uh, spreading, uh, whether that's the gospel, the gospel message, or uh, just going toward uh, serving people around us. We, uh, we are so thankful for the ways that you have continually given so that we can serve Jesus and serve our community. Uh, so it has been incredible to see that. And so uh, to be able to do that together has been, been really cool. Um, so just the ways that you can give here at Stonecrest, um, I would just encourage you, um, we have a text, a check option, um, or online as well. And if you need more information for that, you can go to the website, um, or there will be a pop-up that you can look into there. And Nick, would you pray for our offering? I would love to. Would you bow your heads with me and uh, take this time like as we pray? I, I like to say this a lot. It's, it's really important that we we take a moment and just remember what we're doing here uh, like we are praying to god and and like as we give maybe you give by text or check or online like uh, but being able to set aside a moment and go god this is yours uh, it's important and so would you bow your heads with me and do that together uh, god i i think of each and every person watching right now and whether that's virtually or in person, and I'm reminded of uh, all of us coming together and, and bringing what we have and, and just giving it to you to do with what you will. Lord, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the ways that then you go and, and use that, the, the things that we surrender and, and give up to you just to see the ways that that has been used for your kingdom and for your glory. It's amazing. And, and so, God, I thank you for the opportunities to step into that and partner with you uh, and with your kingdom. God, I pray that you'd use this offering today to continue that process, to continue uh, the spreading of your gospel, uh, of your, your message and your kingdom. Lord, we love you and we just thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we have a few more announcements um, that we'll get to after the service, so stick around. Um, but for now, where you are and as you are able, if you could stand and join us in worship together. Put your hands together, everybody. Get up out of your seats.
Oh, that peace Put me down 
lyrics because they will mean so much to you if you just take a minute and listen. Sing wide, all you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. A place called First. We've been talking about it for four weeks, and today we wrap up with the fifth sermon of a five-part series, A Place Called First. I think there are three statements that are often made by all of us. Certainly, they've been made by me with good intentions, but technically, I think they're incorrect. We talk about my life, my church, and my money. My life is has very little to do with me when I understand who I am in comparison to God. I did not choose when to be born, and I do not know when I'm going to die. The Word of God says that I was designed by God, known by Him before I was in my mother's womb, and He has a set time for me to pass on. My life really is about God. My church I know what I mean when I talk about my church, but really, I don't own this church. There's no other person that I'm aware of that would claim to own this church. What we really mean is we're a group of people called out by God, given a commission from God to act out our life for God. And the commonality of a church is the local group of people, in this case called Stonecrest, that aligns themselves with universal principles called the Large C Church, the people called out by God to have spiritual understanding and devote all of their life to his kingdom. And then we talk about my money. My money would imply that I own it, I can control it. To a certain extent, humanly, yes, that's true. However, 
It's very important for us, I think, to realize that God has allowed us time to live, a spiritual understanding of who we are with eternity in mind, and the money that has been entrusted into our care, all of our wealth put together, enables us to align our focus with His kingdom first. So when I talk about this fifth area of a place called first involving money, I want for us as a church to never forget this concept. Please don't ever consider yourself giving your money to the church ever again. I hope that the Spirit of God reveals to us that we are giving money that was entrusted and belongs to God back to Him in the context of a community or a local church called Stonecrest We're giving money to God through the local church to bring glory back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving money to God through the context of the local church is a matter of managing what we call our life, our money, and our church. I have been so encouraged over the years now into my third decade of being pastor, watching a people of God, called out by God, giving money to God through the context of this church to meet needs in our local area, our surrounding region, and ultimately around the world. The people of God, called out by God with a focus on giving their money to God, is making a difference. Let me give you a few examples. During the pandemic, For the last nine months, when we have had all kinds of new definitions of normalcy and where we preach, how we preach, video or live, meeting, indoors, outdoors, during that time, the reason we report to you about money as a local church of leaders, to you, the givers of the community, is this. The church is never shut down. The church is not shut down. The church is never going to shut down. We've given over $36,000 during the pandemic to support missionaries around the world. We've given thirty-nine, almost $40,000 supporting other churches in the district that's surrounding us called the Metropolitan District of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. We've given $21,000 plus to people within the congregation who have been struggling during the pandemic with loss of jobs or or demotions or, or lack of income. Water wells all the way over in Burkina Faso. I, I think you need to celebrate along with the church leadership team by understanding that $15,000 has been given during the pandemic to put fresh water, drinking water, life-saving water into the mouths of children, moms and dads during the pandemic. There are 70 children in Burkina Faso that have been going to school during the pandemic because of your faithfulness in giving. The emergency relief fund in, uh, in this area, do you realize that we've given $10,000 to people around the world, some of them who cannot walk? They wear flip-flops on their hands and their feet because they crawl to keep up off the mud and the dirt and the filth of the developing world. We've given them tricycles with money that you've been faithful to give, my friend. This is what happens when we understand that we are God's people called out of the world, entrusted by him with a certain amount of money, and we seek first his kingdom. Our life, our church, our money, it's how do we put in a place called first? We've touched Haiti. Almost $7,000 have been given to a couple, Haitian born, now back in Haiti, the Nariah Community Health Clinic. It's never shut down during the pandemic. It's going today in part because of your faithful giving. In the country of Turkey today, I can't say the names of the people, but we have people from this congregation who are living there, making a difference in that country that is not known for Christianity, but it's your faithfulness, my friend, in giving. First choice, women's resources, the life-giving hope of a mom coming in a crisis pregnancy. You gave just shy of $17,000 during the pandemic to save the lives of babies. My friend, area food banks in this area have received from your hands $5,300 
during the pandemic. When the church leadership team reports to you on the financial giving, don't ever think of you giving money to this church. You think of you giving money to God through the context of this church to support the needs of God's creation all the way around the world. Today, when we wrap up this series called A Place Called First, I ask you the question that I've been asking now for four weeks, and Jeff did a wonderful job talking to us last week about the the commodity called money. How do we prioritize what's first? I think there are two things that show up as indicators of how we can measure how we're doing in the place called first in our life. One is the daily planner covered by Jeff last week. Today, I want for us to talk about the second, which is your checkbook register or your online banking records. What do we do with our money? Each week, we focused on this verse, Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. Teach us, O God, teach us to number our days in the right order that we will gain a heart of wisdom. And we've been reminding you each and every week, wisdom is acting what we believe to be true. And we know that we cannot take our money with us after death. However, oftentimes we struggle with being wise with our time and wise with our money. And time was illustrated by putting the certain rocks in the jar in the certain way, beginning with the biggest ones first, and then the the smaller stuff around it. But when we put the right things in the right order, all of the same amounts, but the right order gives power and it gives a place of priority. Jesus said, when you live on this earth, seek first. Seek first. First, a place of top priority. Seek my kingdom first. And all these other things will be added unto you. I'm sure you know that there are 38 parables in the Bible. And 16 out of the 38, almost 50% of the stories that Jesus used to illustrate to his people a deeper understanding of his kingdom, 16 out of 38 of his stories revolve around the theme of money. There are 500 verses in the Bible on prayer, but there are 2,000 verses that revolve around the theme of money. Why? Not because God needs my money. God wants me to understand his heart and to consequently align my heart to be in sequence with his. I think this is why Jesus said, where a man's treasure is, there his heart will also be. There's a biblical principle that predates the Mosaic law. It's called the principle of the first. Now, the Mosaic law is where we first find in the Bible this concept called tithing. But I want you to understand the principle of the first precedes the Mosaic law. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. There are two people mentioned in this chapter. One is named Adam and the other is named Eve. There were no human beings before them. I think the principle of the first is very clearly uh, introduced by God in the very first family on this earth. Let's pick up the reading in the second verse of Genesis chapter 4. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Now notice, one of the sons of Adam and Eve became a shepherd or a herdsman, raising animals, and the other became a farmer, raising fruits and vegetables. The text says that in the course of time, and this implies to me this course of time phrase, that there was not a common recurring practice for Cain to bring the fruits. But it was only when he realized that he had a surplus, that he felt compelled out of the surplus of his savings to give some to God. Well, let's continue. But Abel, his brother, also brought an offering fat portions from some of the firstborn 
of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. I want you to notice the fat portions simply means that Abel brought animals to God and that he is bringing some of the firstborn of the animals to God. It's an ongoing, recurring practice, it seems to me, in the wording of these two, that Abel is ongoingly, every time there's a birth, he's giving the firstborn of his flocks to God. Every time it's the harvest season, he'll give one in ten back to God. It's a principle of the first. For all my life, I've been taught that God did not accept Cain's fruit and vegetable offering because it did not contain blood. Now, I don't want to start a theological argument on that. I just simply want to propose a, what if it were something more than that? It may be. The deep theological truth based on the Mosaic law that there was something to do with the the blood sacrifice, that's very strong evidence that it could be. However, I want for us to keep in mind that this preceded the Mosaic law. And therefore, I suggest to you that this concept is relatively new to my understanding, but I propose it as something that maybe it's something for us to consider and then act on. God seemingly was pleased that Abel routinely and repeatedly gave to God a place called first from the portion of the ongoing birthing season. Here's the principle of the first. God doesn't need your stuff. He wants to know his place in your life. God wants to be loved first. God wants to be loved more than anything else that you love in your life. God is not interested in the amount of our giving as much as he is interested in the order and the motive behind it, my friend, when we think of my money and my life, we'll have a tendency to save and to hoard. But when we think of God's life that he's entrusted into my care, a workmanship designed by him to do good works, which he prepared in advance for me to do, the concept is to give generously. More and more, not hoard for myself, but give more back to God. So I'd like today to offer three kingdom principles that I hope we can live by. Principle number one is God must be first. This principle runs through the Bible. All of the Bible is built on this principle. In fact, the first of the Ten Commandments is built on this very principle. Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. Deuteronomy chapter 6, do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you, for the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God. Now let me say it this way. God is not asking anything from you that he has not already modeled for you. Nothing we could ever do or give could compare to what God did and gave through Jesus on the cross. Think about it this way. God put you before his own son as Jesus cried out to him, Abba, Father, why? Have you turned your back on me? God put you first when Jesus hung on the cross for your sin. 41 years ago, I stood at the head of an aisle in a place called Simpson Memorial Church back then. It's in Nyack, New York. It goes by a different name now. And as I stood at the front of that aisle, I looked and I saw a beautiful young 23-year-old woman named Susan. She was arm in arm with her daddy. And as Susan walked toward me, I was about to listen to her and then to make my own covenant with her. 
that we've maintained and lived out for the last 41 years. And in so many words, what Susan said to me as she arrived at my end of the aisle was this, Brent, there are about 4 billion other guys on this earth today, but from this day forward, I'm going to swear to you to wear this ring and I'm going to demonstrate to you in every one of the days of my future for the rest of them that you are the number one and only guy in my life. That was a special day for me. And I can assure you what I did not do on that day after she said that to me. I did not say to her, I just want you to know, Susan, that there are about four billion girls on this earth today and you are now and forever number two to me. We promised one another that day that we would give one another the number one place of loyalty, faithfulness, and commitment and that no other person, male or female, would come between us. I think that's the principle of the first. That the reason that God calls us in the New Testament to compare the love of Christ to the church and the love that we have for our spouse, he uses the analogy of family because he says when you seek first the kingdom, God says don't have any other gods before me and what you perceive at times to be your life, your church, your money, you understand that all that you are and all that you will be and all of your future is wrapped up in him. The second principle, after God must be first, there's this principle that we put God first by giving him that place in everything. You're made in God's image. Everything, that word everything, goes far beyond money. It includes time, it includes abilities, it includes acts of mercy, it includes showing kindness and demonstrating equality to all men and women in all cultures and in all places, on all socioeconomic levels, and as often as we can create opportunity to do so. We give the place called first in all things because first reveals the place of priority that you and I choose in what we understand from the Bible to be God's truth. First place establishes the priority of the most important things of life. The principle that Moses included in the law years after Adam and Eve lived is found in Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30. And it, but it includes way more than money. A tithe, Moses says, of everything, everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees that belongs to the Lord, it is holy, which means it's set aside, it's set apart to the Lord. The word holy means set apart. It's an act of the will. It's an act of priority. It's a declaration of importance that we choose for this thing that we call our life, our church, our money. It always involves the will. And the choice of a person who chooses to make something holy is the act of setting it apart by applying in their life, during their days, given by God in the right way to prove that God has the place called first. Everything belongs to the Lord. The love of God gives us the percentage rather than the amount so that all of us can participate equally. Some of us make $60,000 a year. Others make $6,000 a year. Others make $600,000 a year. The amounts of money made by the people that are watching on the Zoom varies from person to person. But the principle of the first is always about equal sacrifice, not about equal amounts. $60,000 is the tithe of $600,000, but it's 100% of the earnings of the guy who makes $60,000. So 10% of 60 is six. God had you in mind 
when his gracious love says, I don't need your money, I just need to know what place I hold in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 14, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put in first place God as the number one in your life. These are principles for us to live by. If we do these principles, I believe that they will serve us well. Principle one, God must be first. Principle two, we put God first as an act of our will created in his image so that we place everything underneath the place of God. The third principle is this, the first, the place called first has the power to bless all of the rest. I think this principle is huge. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, in all your ways acknowledge him. Key words, all. And acknowledge. That word acknowledge means puts it in the right place. This is way more inclusive than our money. When we skip down a few verses, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Based on these three biblical principles, I'd like to suggest five very practical things for us to consider doing with our money. You can spend it. You can use it to pay bills. You'll use it to pay your taxes. You can save it or invest it, and you can give it away. There's only one thing that determines the order of that list. And the thing that determines the order of this list is what you perceive to be important. That will include the ability and the responsibility to choose what's most important to us and to put God in his proper place. Susan and I, over the last 24 years, have hosted in our home a lot of people. And every person that's come into this church has been invited to our home for dinner. Now, if you say, I didn't get that list, I, I, I stand to correct you. Yes, you did. In a place called On Deck, Susan and I took it upon ourselves to invite you to the most sacred place in our daily life, our home. And most of you have come at one point or another. It was the most fun thing we've ever done. And the ongoing challenge and joy of being your pastor, just hosting people every eight weeks. We'd have a dinner party, then called On Deck. Never once, never once, Do I recall that Susan ever served leftovers at on deck or at any dinner party that we ever hosted in our home? Now, I ate those leftovers for several days in some cases after the guests left, but I never saw Susan serve leftovers to any of our guests. When guests come to my home or yours, we honor them with our very best, don't we? May I suggest to you that God gave you your home, your job, your health, your ability to think, your ability to reason, your ability to choose. It's called mental health. It's called the ability to earn, keep, and move forward, oftentimes with promotions in a job market. May I remind you that one day you're going to go to God's house. That's right. You're going to be invited to God's house. You're going to stop at a throne called the judgment throne. And God says you're going to give an account of what he entrusted into your care while you were here on this earth. The last person on earth that a wise person would want to dishonor would be God. Because the word of God says, and I think most of us believe, that God owns all things. And he's entrusted some of those things into our life. And over these last five weeks, I've suggested that you and I together find a place called first and make sure that God's first in the time, in the people, in the prayer, and now in the money aspects of our life. Without faith, you see, the Word of God says it's impossible to please God. There, are, there will be many, many times you will not feel like you have enough time in a day or money at the end of the month 
to honor God with what he has entrusted into your care. But the biblical principle of the first on which the entire Bible seemingly is built makes the promise to us that if we put God first, he will honor us forever and ever and ever. Jesus said no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. He continues, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you'll eat or drink or about your body, what you'll wear, is not your life more important than food and the body more important than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, Jesus asked, can hold a single, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor, they don't spin. And yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of those flowers. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is blown away, withered and gone, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans... Ooh, that's a big, powerful word now. The pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But apply the principle of the first. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That means what's right before God, stated in his word as such, and all, all of these things will be added to you. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Here, my friends, the bottom line. Let your life communicate to God daily. God, you have first place. God, you have the first place in my year. You have the first place in my month. You have the first place in my week. You have the first place in my day. You have the first place in my planner. And God, you have the first place in my checkbook, my savings account, my retirement account, my pleasure account. My friend, applying a place called first communicating to God with our actions, teaching to number our days aright, applying what we know to be true. Order is important in the place called first. And according to my understanding of the Bible, unless God is first, my friend, your life and mine is out of order. Belief is the beginning of all relationships. But action is the consummation of them. It's been 41 and a half years now. Susan and I met at the head of an aisle. And we've tried to live out those rules, those commitments, those covenants, and those promises. My friend, God has modeled for you generosity. And he calls you to step out of faith, giving him a place called first. Don't ever forget, Satan believes in God, but does not declare God to be first in Satan's existence. And God says he opposes everyone who refuses to allow him to maintain a place called first in their life. God holds no grudges. And my friend, today is a turning point opportunity. From all past choices to a time of turning to a declaration of future based on new choices that we make this day based on what he's revealing to us from this word. We call that giving our life to Jesus. 
We call that at times making a commitment to God. At times we say it this way, we, we're getting right before God. We're seeking God's first, we're, we're giving our life to Christ. The Bible calls that wisdom in the Bible, saying that a man who understands, hearing the voice of God's Spirit, makes a choice to align their wants with his will. My friend, this is the first day of the rest of your life. This is the day when Jesus says to you, come to me. Give me the place called first. And there will be a day in your future, we'll walk it together. I will take you by the hand into the throne room of God and I will speak on your behalf. I will tell my Father in heaven what I made possible for you on the cross, modeling that for God so loved you that I gave my life on your behalf, my friend. My life, my money, my church, may we from this day forward never ever consider ourselves giving money to the church. May we consider ourselves having put God first to give our money to God through the church that people locally, regionally, and internationally would continue to hear the good news of Jesus. A place called first. Seek first my kingdom. Have no other gods before you. Will you pray with me, please? God, as we wrap up this series, We've talked about the priority of time. We've talked about the priority of eternity. We've talked about the priority of prayer. We've talked about the priority of numbering our days aright. And I think the number one rival God, and the reason that you devoted nearly half of the parables and four times the number of verses to money, as compared to something even as important as prayers, because you knew it would be the number one rival, God, that you would have. And before I close in prayer, I want to just ask you maybe to join me as you take a next step right now. What is your number one rival, God? What is it that you find yourself thinking about when you didn't realize you were thinking about it? Do you pine? Do you have repetitious thoughts concerning maybe your health or your savings or your retirement or your, your income? Oh, my friend, may you realize that God has you. You're the apple of his eye. Today, I invite you to pray along with me this prayer. Lord, I give you my anxiousness. I give you my anxiety. I worry and fret over money. I think and fear that I won't have enough. And so God, I step into the principle of the first. I declare that you will be first in my thoughts, in my life, in my attitude, in my savings, in my giving, in my earnings. God, you are it. To you be all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise as I live out my life understanding that it's yours in the first place. And I want to use all of, quote unquote, my money to fulfill the good works which you prepared in advance for me to do for your glory. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Brent, for taking us there. I, I know, uh, for me at least, like the there's always going to be something that rivals that place of first in my life and like even just as we were watching today like uh, a rival 
for me as it comes to my resources or my money honestly is like a little bit it, it's kind of routine just like for me i i schedule my my tithe or, or my my giving and so it's really easy to actually just forget that i do that and i'm like oh that happened this week uh like that money's out of my bank account now or like um, whether it's my my time or my resources, like one of my greatest strengths, like my my routines, it can also be one of my greatest rivals. Because I think when it comes to routine, I create habits, and habits create complacency or just going through the motion. And it makes it so that I really don't intentionally have this place of first for God in my life. It just my life kind of happens to me, and so I can often forget like. This is something I'm setting aside for God, whether that's my time or my resources. Um, and so that can actually end up being a rival in my life. So I don't know what stuck out to you about it, but that really hit home for me. Yeah. For me, it's the feeling of um, inadequacy in my giving, that I never feel like I have met God's standard for me. Um, and for some reason, I feel like I get to decide what that is, what God's standard is. And when he was talking just about how it isn't about, you know, the number on the piece of paper or like that that's not where my value lies is in that, um, that was definitely kind of the biggest take home for me was that I'm definitely putting something in the wrong place and I'm not putting God in that um, authority of first. Um, but I, I want to know how that hit home for you guys. Um, what is rivaling your first um, in your life? Is it something similar to what we're going through, or is it something completely different? Um, I just want to encourage you that, that that is a process that Jesus is going to take you through, and that's um, something that he does want to step into with you. So I'd encourage you to press into that. Yeah, like at the end of the day, we we want to help you in that process of uh, hearing, understanding, obeying Jesus in every area of, of your life and our lives, and that's something we get to do together as a community. Uh, and so there's a couple ways that you can press into that, like what that next step might be for you. Uh, there's a number uh, that you can call that will come up on the screen now if, if you're like uh, maybe thinking through some stuff and would like prayer or uh, help or support uh, you can call that number and someone would love to talk to you or you can fill out a next steps card on uh, our website uh, and just kind of share with us what you're what you're thinking through or wrestling through and and we would love to walk with you in that uh, it's it's what we're here for and we'd love to help you get plugged in in a way that can help you take steps towards Jesus because at the end of the day that's that's what we're here for um, one last one that we would love for you to step into is the Zoom lounges, if you're watching with us virtually right now, you can join a, a Zoom lounge where we'll connect and talk about next steps and really just catch up with one another as well. If you haven't been to Stonecrest in person in a while because uh, maybe, maybe that's something you can't because you're at risk or uh, maybe some other reasons, but we'd love to be able to still provide that space for you to connect. And so, uh, Right after the 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. services that we stream live every Sunday morning, you can join those Zoom lounges, and we'd love to see you there. And I would just like to say a blessing over you today. Um, I just ask that in everything you're walking through, whether this is a time of difficulty or a time of rejoicing for you, that you would just press in to Jesus, either with that outstretched hand that needs his gentle touch, or whether it's um, a hand that wants to celebrate with him. I would just ask that as you walk through this week, that you would just lean into him and you would press into him in all things. Um, thank you so much for joining us this week, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. See you then.